when we last left you with the blood vessels, there was blood flow going through those capillary beds. Right? Pressure, the force, the arterial pressure on one end was kind of forcing out all the good stuff like fluid, uh, glucose, and oxygen was diffusing through based on a concentration gradient. And then by the time you get to the end of that capillary bed, fluid was being drawn in, right? As well as carbon dioxide and metabolic waste that all these cells of the tissue are producing, right? So when they, they make not only CO2, but other kinds of metabolic wastes uh, based on all their activity, right? So that's drawn in because the concentration out here is greater than it is in the capillary. So it's going back into the system. We know how we get rid of carbon dioxide through the lungs, right? But all this metabolic waste, we got to get rid of that too. Uh, <clears throat> so when that blood again goes through the tissues, eventually it'll make its rounds and it'll go through the liver, right? If it was from the intestine, it goes right there, but eventually everything reaches the liver and these uh, amino acid uh, breakdown products like ammonia uh, are going to enter the liver. They're going to go through this cycle, right, NH4, and they're going to be turned into urea. Right? Urea is just a product that, you know, it's an ammonia product that is safe for the body. Ammonia can get really toxic pretty quick if the levels are too high. Urea, you know, it's a waste product ultimately, but it's, it's not toxic. There's also... Uh, there's also uric acid from DNA breakdown and creatinine uh, from creatine breakdown in your muscles. So those are all floating around. Your body needs to get rid of them. It's floating around in your blood. So at some point during the course of circulation, your blood is going to flow into your kidneys. Right? And there is where all this filtration magic is going to happen. Right? It's going to, your blood's going to go in. It's going to get filtered, at least some of it is. That is, that all that urea, waste products is going to be taken out, and then it's going to be put back in the normal circulation, not through these arteries, but through veins right there, right? So that's what the whole kidney is. And functionally speaking, that excretion is one of its main functions, getting rid of organic metabolic waste. But since it's going through this whole system, it's also going to balance your electrolytes, your uh, ions, as well as maintaining your proper water balance in your body right there. And that'll also be connected to blood pressure, right? Because the more fluid you have in your body, the higher your blood pressure is. So you can increase or decrease your blood pressure based on how much water you have. You could also increase it, your oxygen carrying capability, based on how many red blood cells you have in your blood. Right, so all this is urinary system functions as that blood is being filtered through the kidney. Here is your kidney. This is an artificial kidney. Right, blood is being brought in through this line artery. <clears throat> uh, blood is being brought into this machine. It's circulating through this machine, through this selectively permeable membrane of this machine. And then in this machine, like in an ideal kidney machine, all the bad stuff would go out in the surrounding areas and all the good stuff would just stay in these tubes and then be brought back into the body, right? So you could just remove toxins and whatever, whatever you don't need in the body, you could remove it right through here. It'll drop in this little storage space and then the rest of the blood will return back to the body clean, right? That's, that would be the ideal case. Kidney, just being a biological machine is not going to really work that way exactly. But it's kind of like this. When you think of what the kidney is doing, this is what it's doing. It's filtering the blood. It's cleansing it. So to do that, your main thing is your kidneys, right? That's where your filtering mechanisms are going to be. And then you have a couple of other organs associated with it that are just going to be for transport, storage, and more transport, right? Your ureter is just going to transport. The bladder is going to store it. Your urethra is going to... Uh, <clears throat> allow excretion of it eventually. So those kidneys, right, the main sort of areas right here, uh, main organs are your right and left kidneys right here, your right kidney, your liver, remember, is sitting right here, so it's a little bit lower. Right? And the area would be around T12, L3, just below kind of the floating ribs are sitting about right here, right? 
This area right here where your renal arteries go in, your renal veins come out, your ureters come out is called the hilum, this little area right there, right? And uh, this was about the right kidney being lower and the hilum is this area where all the vessels and tubes and stuff go in and out of there. Remember this peritoneal cavity, that was the parietal peritoneal covering it and this is where all, all your small intestines and stomach and everything was. And then you also had these other uh, organs that were behind that cavity. And so kidneys are one of those, retroperitoneal. Retro so here it is. Here's that parietal peritoneum again. Everything inside it, like your spleen, your stomach, is inside the peritoneal cavity. Everything behind it, like your pancreas and your kidneys, are going to be behind it. So externally, right, here's that aorta and your inferior vena cava going down, your kidneys are sitting right in here. And they're also, they're kind of, even though they're a little bit sitting below your rib cage right here. So they're, at least their inferior portions are kind of exposed right there and a little vulnerable. They're also kind of packed, heavily packed in there uh, through these fat muscles and rib. Here's your psoas major right here. Here's your, some of the uh, erectus spiny muscles going up and down, so it's kind of packed right in there inside this retroperitoneal junction right here. All right, so you got this fibrous capsule, dense irregular connective tissue giving it protection, and there's also this, what's called this renal fascia, kind of surrounding and uh, hugging it in inside that retroperitoneal space along with all the fat, right? So it's, it's pretty secure there, so it's not jiggling around when you run, right? Otherwise, it's just kind of floating around there in your inside the space right there. So here's your kidney right here. And then first we're just gonna deal with these two other uh, parts, uh, these couple other parts of your, of your urinary system right here, right? And that'll be from leaving the kidneys, it's gonna go into your ureter and then your bladder, right? And your ureters are pretty much this little tube right here, right? It's not really that much speaking, it's just gonna transport the urine from the kidney to the bladder. Right, so these ureters begin in this area called the renal pelvis that exits the um, exits the kidney through that hilum, and it's a muscular tube. So it's going down back here, and it um, <clears throat> is going to move the urine not just through gravity but also through peristalsis. Where else did we see peristalsis? How many times can I mention peristalsis during that comprehensive exam? So many times. It also comes up in the reproductive act, uh, lectures, right? So peristalsis is kind of squeezing. Remember that whole action with smooth muscles squeezing the urine down a little bit. So even if you're standing on your head, then uh, urine can be moved over to the bladder, right? It's lined, right? Just like any of the tubes, it's going to be lined with an epithelial. In this case, it's that transitional epithelial, if you remember what that was. That is that epithelial, which it looks like the, a little bit like stratified squamous, but when it stretches, it's going to distend. That is, it's basically going to allow that tissue to stretch. So that as urine is passing through, both the ureters and your bladder, that whole epithelial wall can be stretched. All right, so the ureters go down and they enter through the back of the bladder through what they call these ureteral opens, ureteral, sorry, ureteral openings right here. Right. So these are going to, this is where the passage comes in. They're going to fill the bladder up with the urine from there, right? When the uh, bladder contracts right here because this is all going to be smooth muscle when it squeezes to contract those will close to prevent backflow all right so that's the ureter just that tube going down from the kidney to the bladder right? and there's the bladder and so here is the ureter coming down for males uh, and then for females it's going down here right and so and this is where you start to get what you call sexual dimorphism. That is a difference between male and female right here. But in either case, uh, your urine is filling up right here. 
this is a collapsible bag that can hold two cups or you know when it is expanded when you really got to pee and everything expands to hold more right it's going to be a transitional epithelial there's going to be rugae like the stomach and that will allow for that expansion to occur as well as the transitional epithelial All right, so the lining is going to have those folds and the muscle layer it's a triple smooth muscle layer it's called the detrusor muscle and that's what will contract and squeeze the urine out uh, of through to the urethra over here and the passageway out to the urethra is called the trigony area and it's a triangular region it's going to be three-dimensional and it's going to kind of funnel it into the urethra over here it's a little bit of a different lining than this so it, it tends to be in and because it's close to urethra this is one of the areas that tends to get infection uh, if there is a UTI any kind of urinary tract infection so and now here's again it's in, after it leaves the bladder you're going to start to see differences between male and female at this point right so for the male urethra it's going to be about seven or eight inches from the bladder from where it starts to the opening at the end right there right so that urethra is a little longer and then there's going to be three distinct regions that it's going to pass through uh, because it's going to pass through a couple different structures first your prostatic where your prostate is for males and then there's a short membranous region as it passes through your muscle walls right there of your uh, pelvic floor muscles and then through the spongy tissue of the penis through the end right there right so there's these three regions right here prostatic membranous and spongy penile right and so for here's the bladder right here it's opening right here here's the prostate right here the difference the other with the male and female also is that at this point it's going to be shared with your reproductive tract right so when we get to following the pathway of sperm and the reproductive tract this is where they're going to meet up right so they're for males, those two pathways are going to be joined. Right. For females, it's a little simpler. Right? It goes from the bladder right to the opening right there. It's a much shorter one. And the, the reproductive tracts are completely separated at this point. Right? So the urethra is right here, and then right behind it is the vagina and the uterus. So those two pathways are completely separate, unlike the male. And then for females, because it's so short and because it's close to the anus in this area, uh, the bacteria that might uh, be, it might be exposed to around this area is more likely to get infected uh, because of that right there, right? So bacteria can get in much easier because of the shorter distance and the closeness um, to the anus. This can be, if it does get up there, it can be, you know, flushed out with urine, but quite often it gets infected right here. This is why females are much more susceptible to these UTIs than males are. That's the urethra uh, for males and females. And then for either, you have two sphincters, that is valves that are gonna control passage, right? This internal urethral sphincter, uh, it's gonna be that smooth muscle lining that's going to hold it in under normal condi uh, conditions and not, it's not under voluntary control, right? So it's gonna stay closed uh, until there's this urge to pee, right? All my slides are messed up here. All right, so there's your internal urethral sphincter. That's a, a smooth muscle, involuntary. And then you have with your pelvic floor muscles, the skeletal muscle, uh, it forms the external urethral sphincter, right? This is the same thing we saw with the internal and external anal sphincter to control passage of feces, right? You can control your urine, right? And that's all through these two different layers. So this will relax uh, when you, when this wall is expanded enough, your, your body will say, hey, let that out. But your brain will say, no, not here. I'm in sitting in class right now, right? So that your bladder. Right, now we get to the big gun right here, your kidney, right? This whole filtration process where the blood is coming in, being filtered, and then leaving. So when you're looking, you're going to be looking at a cross section of the kidney, right? Here's the kidney uh, as a whole. Here's a cross section of it. You'll see these kind of internal structures within there. Right? And then you'll see kind of different 
tissue, like just visibly this darker area and the lighter area, right? And these are all going to reflect different functions. You're going to see these kind of funnel looking things over here too. And then as you look microscopically, you'll look into one of these regions, magnified. These are all distorted. There's like millions and millions of these, so they're not that big, but this is really what we'll be looking at right here, these microscopic structures. So internally, when you cut it open like this, you'll be looking at something like this. You see this lighter outside layer? <clears throat> this is called the cortex, renal cortex. Right? That's going to be the surrounding of it all. This is that lighter area. And that's going to basically be this tissue right here, right? In this cortex is something to be talked about later, these renal corpuscles, right? So later on when we're talking about these little structures right here, this they are located in the renal cortex. Because okay? these will be the basic unit of the filtration that we'll be talking about. All right, and then extension of that cortex, right, going down here, is called the renal columns, these strips. And that's basically the same sort of tissue, the same kind of makeup as the renal cortex right there. It's just going, digging deep down into here. And then the second part, main part of the kidney is the medulla, right? So you have a cortex on the outside, a medulla on the inside. And these will contain these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in this case, seven pyramids right here. This is part of the renal medulla and largely they're just these pyramids right here. These are gonna be filled with these tubules in here, millions and millions of tubules. Right here. So just to get a 3D sense of this, right? This is one of the models, right? This is it split in half, the kidney right here. You see these kind of cup shaped things right here. And what I'm gonna do is actually go to that 3D app for a second. So this is looking at a, you know, they've already cut it in half for you, right? Here's the renal artery going in, here's the renal vein going out. The little party hat right here is the uh, adrenal medulla. That's where you make adrenaline and stuff like that, right? For your endocrine system. That just happens to be sitting on this, um, uh, on top of the kidneys right here. All right, so this is a cross section here. And then you got the renal cortex on the outside. And these are the renal pyramids of the, of the medulla. And then in the middle right here is those renal columns, right? And then you can see the blood vessels going in here. They're kind of snaking in. They're kind of circulating around. And they're going to branch off finally. But what I want to show you is on this side, what I've done is removed all the cortical areas. And all that's left is those pyramids. And you get a better sense of the 3D-ness of them, right? That's what your kind of kidneys, these pyramids here. Once you get into physiology, you know, the fact that they're shaped like this. I hear that 3D shape right here and that this region up here and this region down here is going to be very different as far as the salt concentration, the osmolarity, because all those tubules that dig, that dip way down into here and then as they move down deeper and deeper to these areas, they're going to encounter like different osmolarity and there's going to be absorption and secretion based on whatever, right? Trying to kind of reabsorb back all the stuff that's been uh, put in these tubules right here. So all these, each of these pyramids are kind of feeding into these areas right here. So just keep these in mind when we get back to these structures right here, right? But those are your pyramids. Right here, that's gonna contain all the tubules. And then these are the, the blood vessels, right? They're gonna come in, come in through the arteries. They're gonna snake around. Eventually the capillaries will be kind of going out into the cortex area right here. So there was those uh, pyramids right there, right? So within the cortex, part of the cortex and then part of the pyramids here, you have what we call the functional unit of the kidney, which is the nephron. 
right, and we'll talk about the components in a second, but that is our main focus right here, right? This little unit right here, the combination of the blood vessels and these series of tubes uh, that are going to cause, that are gonna do the filtration here and reabsorption and secretion, right? So schematically speaking, blood is coming in and the filtrate is gonna be passed into this whole filtration process, the nephron right here, right? It's gonna be passed into this whole system right here. And then it's gonna go through this series of tubules and that series of tubules is gonna be associated with these capillaries here. And then there's gonna be exchange of material through them uh, in different ways right there, right? So that's your nephron, right? Where the filtrate is basically. So there's gonna be three processes, filtration, right? Getting blood, the filtrate from the blood, reabsorbing everything back that you want and then secreting stuff out of the body into this tubule system that you don't want. Right, so this is your nephron. Filtration, reabsorption, and then secretion are gonna be the major processes here. First, we're gonna look at the blood supply, right? Your renal arteries supplying oxygenated blood to the kidneys as well as the initial, what'll be the filtrate. Uh, going in here, right? So this is gonna, the blood vessels are gonna go in. Blood vessels are gonna go in, they're gonna kind of snake around here. And eventually, you don't have to know these, just the artery. You could skip these segments right here. And then the cortical radiate right here, these ones, these vessels that are going up into the cortex right here, these will feed into the capillary beds here, right? And this is where all the action will be, right? This, this kind of association right here. Right. And we're going to start off right around this area, the glomerulus. All right, so blood coming in here, going up these cortical radiates right here, being passed into these capillary bowel called the glomerulus right here. So here it is again. Here's the blood coming in, and it's being uh, routed into here, into these capillary beds, or over here into this capillary bed, right? And then the filtrate from this, it's not the blood itself, but stuff that comes out of this capillary is gonna be captured in this capsule and then be passed through all these tubules right here and eventually into these ducts uh, for excretion, whatever we didn't want right there, right? So you have the, this capillary bed is called the glomerulus, right? So blood is coming in and then going through this capillary bed right here. And so there's about 50 loops of this. This is only showing a couple. <clears throat> but blood is coming in through what's called the afferent arterioli. Right, coming in, being forced in through here. Blood is circulating around. And then not blood, but like water, uh, waste products, um, non-waste products are coming out and flooding this little space right here as the blood is moving through. About 20% of what comes in in here is filtered out into the space. The rest leaves through what's called the efferent arterioli right here. So normally a artery arterioli comes into a capillary bed, leaves a venule, right? In this case, an arterial is going in, an arterial is going out. It's an afferent an efferent arterioli. So here's the artery coming in. It's not leaving off oxygen necessarily. Uh, that's not any of its function or nutrients for as a regular capillary bed, right? <clears throat> I mean, they could have called it a vein, I guess, but it's still acting like an arterioli based on its structure and everything, the smooth muscle, I'm guessing. You could still control, but it feeds into this second capillary bed that it's connected to. So here's the arteria, afferent arteriole coming in. And then the efferent arteriole is going to go through this whole capillary bed that, I mean, not capillary bed, but this uh, line of capillary that's associated with these tubules before being fed back into the veins right here. So it, only when it gets to pass this whole capillary that it becomes a vein again. So going in, coming out, is your arterioles, right? So when we talk about the renal corpuscle right here, that is your capillary bed, the glomerulus, and the surrounding capsule, right? That's a renal corpuscle. And I don't really care about 
parietal and visceral, except these podocytes do come into play. These little cells that are lining the capillaries here have something to do with the filtration. Okay. So again, <clears throat> blood coming in, going into this whole series of tubules right here. And then the filtrate is going to be moving through these tubules. Different things are going to happen to it at different regions of these tubules before it's gone into these collecting ducts, right? But when we're talking about this whole process of filtration, absorption, and secretion, that's happening with all these tubules right here and these distinctly re named regions of the tubules. This whole thing is called the nephron, right? So the renal corpuscles which we just mentioned was the glomerulus and the capsule. And these renal tubules make up the nephron. Right? And a couple of those might feed into these collecting duct right here. Right? So that here's a nephron, here's another nephron, and they're feeding into this single collecting duct. All right? Everybody understand what a nephron is? Yep. Yes. Good. It's a renal corpuscle, which is, it's the glomerulus and the capsule. And the corpuscle plus the tubicles, tub tubules, is the... Nephron. Nephron. All right. So there's a nephron. There's another nephron. These are two different types. You see the tubules, in this case, mostly stay up here. Right? All the blood vessels that are going to surround, all the small capillaries that are surrounding this one, and then the capillaries surround this one. Again, if you're taking physiology, you're going to hear about the vasa recta and paratubular capillaries, right? And these are just the location because they're going to be doing different things like the stuff up here is mainly just reabsorption of the stuff. Down here, they're going to be heavily involved in concentrating the urine right here. But these distinct capillaries up in the cortex medulla, they have names, right? The ones up in the cortex are called the peritubular capillaries. The ones dipping deep down into the medulla are called the vasa recta. Maybe it'll make more sense as we go along, right? So going back to our kidney, there's about, remember there's only seven, eight, up to maybe 10, 15 of those pyramids. We have about a million of these nephrons per unit. So probably this is way off scale right here, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of them in there, right? And then they have those functions which you talk about filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. <clears throat> Again, uh, well, if you're taking physio, you're kind of immersed in these two ideas. So these two terms, reabsorption, you know, this is when it's going from the body, I'm sorry, from the tubules back into the body, right? So it's basically going back and by the body, I mean ultimately back into the blood flow. So if you're reabsorbing something, it was out either in the tubules or interstitial fluid, and you're bringing it back basically into normal circulation, right? So it's going through the, you know, uh, vascular tubing, uh, epithelial cells, and then the capillary beds, and back into the blood cells, right? Secretion means that you're taking stuff from the blood and then putting it back into these tubules right here, right? And then this term filtration is occurring right in this capsular space right there. So those three terms will be, will be kind of thrown around a lot. So make sure you understand the difference between the secretion will ultimately be, you know, the stuff that's bound for excretion that is actually getting rid of from your body. Reabsorbing is getting stuff that we want back in our body. Gotcha. All right. So for these nephrons, you got two different types. The cortical nephrons, more up in the cortex region. And then you have some that are just next to the medullary. Those are called juxtamedullary nephrons right there. And even though they only make up a small percentage, that's pretty much what you talk about in physiology right here. These, you got these cortical ones, and then you got these juxtamedullary ones where this tube Again, this is what I just said, right? The, the, the tube is going to dip way down in there, right? And that'll have uh, physiological significance as well as the vessels that are going alongside it will.
things. But these are the two types, and it's not just their position here. It's this, it's this dipping down here that matters. All right, so we're kind of going to go over these each different step right here, right? So for this first step, that filtration, again, blood coming in into this capsule, into that glomerulus, and then stuff leaving it into this capsule to filtrate and then out the efferent arterioli right there, right? And then once it leaves the capillaries and in the space, it's called filtrate, right? That's blood, that's like a plasma uh, fluid with dissolved solutes in it, right? And so remember last time we talked, when we talked about the capillaries, we were talking about this, uh, these pores, these fenestrated holes are where a lot of stuff can get out easy, right? Rather than the continuous one. So this is very porous capillaries. And remember those capillaries are covered by those specialized cells called podocytes. And the podocytes have what are called foot processes, that is extensions of the cell membrane that are going to be important in controlling the makeup of the filtrate. But you're making filtrate out of that blood right there. And then that's gonna, that filtrate is what will move through the tubules. <clears throat> All right, so initial filtrate is going to be formed as water and dissolved solutes is going to diffuse from the blood into this capsular space right here. So along with the metabolic waste we're trying to get rid of, there is a lot of water, there's a lot of glucose, there's a lot of amino acids. Basically anything that can fit through these pores are going to be let out into that filtrate. Right, so along with the metabolic waste, all that stuff you want to retain is also being formed in this filtrate right here. Here is a close-up. Right? Here's the capillary lumen. This is where your blood flow is thrown through, uh, flowing through. This is a, uh, just a single kind of capillary vessel cross section, and then out here is going to be that capsular space. But you got that foot process of the podocyte covering the capillary. Okay, so all these are gonna be kind of adding an extra filtration barrier right here, right? So here's your capillary lumen. Here's a big red blood cell, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of the size of these holes right here. Only like, so water and dissolved nutrients have to get through these fenestrations as well as through the basement membrane. And they also have to pass through these foot processes right here, these filtration slits of the podocytes. Okay, so you got an idea of what's passing through here, right? Basically everything, uh, except for anything that can fit through this hole is basically getting through there. <clears throat> right, so here is your fenestrated endothelium. Here's that basement membrane. Here's these, what's called filtration slits of the podocytes, the cells that are lining the capillaries. Right there, so fluid is coming out here, and then to get into there, it's gotta pass those two barriers, but it's pretty porous, so things are coming out here, but not big proteins like that, right? It's mostly smaller stuff like glucose. I think albumin, uh, some of the bigger proteins, normal blood proteins, don't usually get in this spot right here. All right, so you got the idea of the filtrate right here, right? Filtrate's being made, and then it's gonna be passed into this series of tubules. Okay, so here's the important point right here, <clears throat> when you get, especially when you get to uh, physiology. Filtrates being made and a lot of stuff is in this that we want to get back, right? So the blood is dumping it kind of indiscriminately through in the space. You got glucose, vitamins, essential minerals and stuff being dumped in along with all the waste products. So the blood dumps it in here into the space, but then it says, okay, I'm gonna follow you along the tubules and get it back as you move through this tubule system. So that, you know, these reabsorption thing is gonna be basically these, as it moves through these tubules, it's gonna be moving through different environments and then there's gonna be passage of substances between these two, you know, between the tubules and between the surrounding capillaries. Functionally speaking, you'll wanna know that this first region, right, as the fills, Filtrate first uh, passes into this tubule system. This is called a proximal convoluted tubule because it's proximal to the capsule. It is going to be lined, is going to be where your main absorb reabsorption 
is occurring, right? All that water and night good stuff that you want to keep is going to be reabsorbed back into the body in this area. And, you know, the microvilli, again, increased surface area. That's the functionally significant epithelial lining right there. You have a lot of microvilli. Right? So in this proximal convoluted tubule, you're doing, you're getting a lot of this reabsorption going on. And this is mostly, remember, going to be in that cortical area, right? That's where the proximal convoluted tubules are. Here is the proximal convoluted tubule, renal afferent, efferent arteriole. And it's going to, this first set of capillaries here is going to be kind of following along the tubules right here. And that first set of tubules is called the peritubular capillaries, right? They're up in the renal cortex and they're picking up all that water, glucose, anything we wanted to get back, they're picking it all up as it is reabsorbing it from those tubules because they'll, they'll leave the tubules basically back into the fluid around it and then back into the vessels, right? That's what your paratubular capillaries. And I think like 80 or something percent of the water is reabsorbed in this region right here before it dips down to the second area. So those are your paratubular capillaries. Up in the renal cortex associated with the proximal convoluted tubules, as well as, as we'll see, the distal convoluted tubules. But hang on on that for a second. All right. Before it gets into the distal convoluted tubules, that proximal convoluted tubules is going to turn into this nephron loop. The nephron loop <clears throat> is going to descend way down into those pyramids right there, right? The tube is going to go way down into the pyramids right there and then come back up out of those pyramids back into the renal cor cortex area. For what you want to know is that during this time here, it's basically going to concentrate the urine right here because they're going to reabsorb most of the rest of the water, but you're also going to uh, reabsorb the sodium and chloride ions. And again, in physiology, you'll see how that happens both passively and actively. So nephron loop dipping way down to the medulla and its function is concentration. So here the important point is that fluid moving down toward the apex of the renal medulla is encountering increasingly solute concentration in the surrounding interstitial fluid and water is leaving the tubes accordingly. The fluid moving back up toward the renal cortex will have ions actively pumped out of it so that by the time it gets to the distal convoluted tubule, most of the water and ions have been reclaimed. That big dip down here of that nephron loop, you have a surrounding network of capillaries. These are called the vasa recta. So all the water that's being let out of the tubules is being reabsorbed back into the surrounding capillary network that's going down deep um, into the renal medulla right there. That's called the vasorecta reabsorbing water. Again, when you get to physio, you'll learn about counter current exchange and how that works optimally to get back the water it needs and do it based on the flow of the blood, but you don't have to know that here. All right. So that's tubular, most of your tubular reabsorption, right? Happening in your proximal convoluted tubule, your nephron loop. And then you're also going to have some of that as you move out back into the cortex. But at this point, you're also going to have tubular secretion. That is stuff coming from the blood vessels being secreted out for these tubules to get rid of eventually. So when you think of the distal convoluted tubule, you want to think of this as a location for active secretion of ions, acids, drugs, and toxins, and also further reabsorption of water and sodium. And this will be under control of circulating levels of aldosterone. So the filtrate here has pretty much been formed, uh, but the distal convoluted tubules are going to loop back and communicate with a group of specialized cells near the glomerulus to kind of give a report of what the filtrate looks like. 
So here is the capsule. Here is your distal uh, proximal convoluted tubule where it first enters the system right here, right? And so it's gonna go through all your proximal convoluted tubule, your nephron loop, and then back to your distal convoluted tubule. But your distal convoluted tubule is gonna loop around and then head back close to the area of where blood flow is going into this area. And this is a weird sort of arrangement, right? But you know, if you look at this proximal convoluted tubule, here's the filtrate flow. Down to here, it's going to dip down into the medulla through the nephron loop and then back around here and loop around back toward this whole capsular space right here. Now your blood, your body has a way to monitor what's been reabsorbed, what's been secreted at this point, actually before this point, uh, you know, what's happened in this area, right? So if it comes back here and your body wants to respond to what's happening down here, these little cells right here can detect stuff, uh, what's in this filtrate at this point. So it's another monitoring station where the body's gonna further control reabsorption and secretion right here. And so this little space, this group of cells right here, uh, will just, you know, this is gonna be very, very briefly talked about here. And all you wanna know is this is called the juxta glomerular apparatus just next to the glomerulus complex, right? Your JGA, this group of cells that's gonna kind of monitor what's been happening with the tubular fluid. In response to what's happened with that tubular fluid, uh, it can, if needed, secrete the hormone uh, renin. And that's what you wanna know about this JGA. It secretes renin. Renin is a hormone and it's got a very complicated pathway, which you'll have to know about in physiology. For us, we'll just say it's magic, that it leads to increased sodium reabsorption, right? And then if you increased sodium reabsorption, that's going to increase the blood pressure because water will follow it and you'll have more water, you'll have more fluid in your veins that'll lead to increased blood pressure, right? So if your blood pressure was low, you secrete renin, you end up with higher blood pressure. Uh, that's happening, uh, a lot of that sodium reabsorption is happening in that distal convoluted tubule. Then it leaves the nephron proper and goes into the collecting duct. And at which point, for the most part, it would be passively um, just passed out uh, for urination eventually, right? But there's one more point of control here. And that is when you are dehydrated, the hypothalamus will cause the release of uh, the hormone, antidiuretic hormone, otherwise known as vasopressin. What ADH does is make the cells of the collecting duct wall more permeable to water. And it does this by adding more water channels to the cells there. Water is gonna flow out of the collecting duct, but because the surrounding interstitial fluid has a very high solute concentration there. So your body is reabsorbing more water and your urine is more concentrated, which is why your pee is so yellow when you're dehydrated. The collecting duct is gonna lead into the papillary duct, which will be the final output of the kidney, uh, leading into the minor calluses, which will lead eventually to the renal pelvis for excretion, right? So it's gone through this whole system. Right? It's been reabsorbed. The stuff we want has been reabsorbed, and now we're gonna pee out the stuff that we don't want, right? So at the bottom of these renal pyramids right here, right, here's the collecting duct. It's all gonna empty into these spaces called the minor calyx right here, right? There, a bunch of those minor calluses together are gonna feed into what's called a major calyx, right? So each one of these little cups, right here's a minor, and then these are the major calluses. Right? They are all going to feed into what's called the renal pelvis right there. So they're all collecting the urine at each individual spot, pulling it together, and then they're going to pull it into that part right here. All right. So I think that's almost it here. It's going to summarize water, urea, 
and all sorts of different salts, right, are going to be uh, made into this filtrate and then passed out. We're going to reabsorb all the stuff we want back into the blood supply and then secrete all the stuff that we don't want. And that's your whole urine production summary. Right? And I don't know if I'm going to ask this because we don't have any time, but uh, your, your, your kidneys, this is for your own benefit. This, this will be something you could use throughout your entire life. Not really, but maybe your medic, maybe as you go through school, you'll, you'll have to know this. Blood is being filtered in your kidney. And it's also being filtered in your spleen. Spleen is full of white blood cells, so it's monitoring your blood for pathogens. So it's really part of the immune system, as well as to kind of recycle older uh, blood cells and stuff like that. So both of them are kind of filtering the blood, but they have very different functions. That's it for the urinary system. We'll see you next time.